Hello, thank you for deciding to watch my presentation on advanced clocking solutions from 5 nanometers to 180. Following a brief introduction to our company, I'll introduce you to different kinds of jitter and why they're important. Then I'll introduce our fractional PLL architecture and why we put a DAC inside. This fractional PLL is very flexible and it's been used in many different applications and I'll talk about some of those. And finally, I'll introduce some of our specialized PLLs, which have been used when the fractional PLL is not the right solution. Our company has been in business since 2006, and today we've served more than 230 customers, helping them bring chips to production in five nanometers through to 180. The quality of our IPs and our excellent support have resulted in multiple awards from TSMC and SMIC. Much of our revenue comes from PLLs, and the core of this business is our fractional PLL architecture. The versatility of this PLL has resulted in some staggering production volumes. For example, in 28 nanometers, we've helped great people bring more than 140 chips to mass production, with more than 4 billion PLLs proven in the market. We also have special purpose PLLs designed for clocking DDR5 in cadence is DDR5, or for low jet of uh, analog front ends, or low power Internet of Things. We used our low jet of PLL also in our multi protocol CERDES PMA, which is used in MicroSemi's current FPGA model, the Polar Fire. We've ported this multi protocol CERDES PMA to TSMC 12 and 16 where we serve up to PCI Gen 4, but also TSMC 40 LP up to 12 and a half gigabits per second. We have over 20 other special purpose CERDES PMAs targeting specific applications. So now let's talk about Jitter. The diagram on the screen at the moment is what you might see if you captured a clock on, a, on an oscilloscope. If we look at the scope trigger on a rising edge and then, and then zoom in on the first rising edge after that and use the histogram function of the oscilloscope to capture a histogram of where the rising edges form, fall, the histogram would represent the period jitter of the clock or of the PLL. The one sigma, the, the one sigma value of this Gaussian is the RMS jitter of RMS period jitter. If we move our focus to the right and look at the second rising edge, what we're looking at is the cycle to cycle jitter or the two cycle jitter. And with purely random jitter, the relationship between these, the extent of these two Gaussians is the square root of two. Both of these jitter values are short term jitter and determined by the performance of the VCO only. And they're important for digital time enclosure. If we continue to move our, our focus or to the right, eventually when we get to a time that is much more than one on the, the PLL bandwidth, we're looking at the long-term jitter. This is a measurement of the closed loop performance of the PLL, and this long-term jitter is, is important for ADCs, DACs, and communication circuits like SODIs. Changing, circuit, changing tracks a little, I want to show the block diagram of a classical integer PLL. If you open a PLL textbook, you'll see a diagram like this. The PFD or phase frequency detector is comparing the rising edges of the divided input clock to the rising edges of the divided VCO clock. And when the PLL loop is closed, these two edges are aligned with a, an additional output divider the output frequency of the PLL is expressed by this formula here, and the smallest step or in output frequency relative to the output frequency is equal to or roughly equal to one on the feedback divider. In a typical integer PLL, M might be about 50, and so this means that the smallest step in the output frequency is around 2% or 20,000 ppm. In many cases, this is small enough, but often it is not. Fractional PLLs add a modulator in between the input, fre uh, input frequency divider, which is now a integer value plus a fractional value, 
And this modulator continuously changes the feedback divider so that the average value of the feedback divider is the, is the value expressed by int and frac. In this case, the output frequency is expressed by the same formula, except that M is the average value of M. And the relative output step is now multiplied by the number of fractional bits or two to the number of fractional bits with 24 fractional bits, which is as many as we use in our fractional PLL and a typical value of M of 20 or more. The smallest change in the output frequency is now extremely small, much smaller than 0.01 ppm. So how would that modulator work? This slide shows two examples targeting an average feedback divider of 10.25. In this case, in the simple direct application, I might set the feedback divider to 10, 10, 10, 11, 10, 10, 10, 11. And if I continuously repeat that, the average feedback divider is 10.25. The advantage of this scheme is that it's extremely simple, but the disadvantage is that we get repeating spurs or re repeating deviations in the output frequency, and those could be measured as spurs. Many, many years ago, in fact, decades ago, mathematicians came up with a scheme called delta sigma modulation, which uses more values around the target value and modulates them over much wider deviations, but faster. The result is that these tones are shifted to a much higher frequency and can be filtered with a much smaller loop filter. The disadvantage was larger or more complex complexity in the modulator, but because the modulator is purely digital, Today, that doesn't add much complexity to our circuit. Also, many years ago, mathematicians pointed out that the errors introduced by the fractional modulation were actually not random as they appeared to be on a spectrum, but were pseudo random. And so with the right circuit might be correctable. In 2000 or 2001, some discrete chip companies worked out how to do this, and Silicon Creations worked out how to implement this in 2006. Our solution reuses the current that the VCO was using anyway, and reuses many of the transistors needed in the circuit, and so it adds almost no area or no power. Yet, the measurement of the output jitter of the PLL shows that the performance is really very good. This phase noise measurement in measures the noise at any specific frequency of the phase deviations from the IDL output phase. And you can see with the black line, we're measuring the performance of the integer PLL, quite good. With the DAC turned off, we can see that the fractional spurs add pseudo random noise that increases the phase noise in the mid band range of the, of the PLL. When we turn on our DAC, we get around 20 dBs of improvement, which enables a really small loop filter to be used in a PLL that performs better than many PL cascades of two integer PLLs and enables the PLL to be used for some high quality applications. Now let's look at a real fractional PLL in our range. This diagram is a block diagram from our 40, 40G PLL or our 28 uh, HPC PLL. You can see input frequency ranges and output frequency ranges that are very wide. Adding to the versatility of the PLL, we take the divided feedback clock and output that to the core and use the rising edge of that clock to, to clock in the target feedback divider. This feature enables the PLL to continuously load new feedback divider values or in other words, continuously update the target frequency. If the steps are relatively small, less than 5%, the PLL will not lose lock and moves to the new value in a controlled and accurate way. The Verilog model from our PLL accurately models the instantaneous frequency and so enables safe applications of dynamic frequency scaling. The colors in this plot are shown in the key on the right-hand side the lime green color represents the analog core circuits, which run on the IO supply. Running from the IO supply enables us to give truly good supply rejection, enabling multiple PLLs to share a single core supply.
a single I.O. supply. The blue and orange colors represent the core logic running at the output clock rate and the input clock rate. When we do this, we can allow multiple PLLs to core, share core supplies, and in the case where the supply impedance is high, we can isolate the output logic, meaning that it is not disturbed by other disturbances on the supplies. The ability to continuously change the frequency uh, target is used in our spread spectrum modulator. Our spread spectrum modulator is provided as a very small R RTL circuit that continuously changes the frequency in a sawtooth manner. The frequency of this changes, the extent of the change, and the target frequency are all programmable in a digital manner and result in a spectrum which is precisely controlled. We've also used the ability to continuously update the target frequency in our Jetta Cleaner solution. This solution embeds the fractional PLO multiplying a fixed reference clock into a digital loop filter, and the digital loop filter has arbitrarily small bandwidth. We've measured down to one hertz of bandwidth in our lab, and the resulting Jetta Cleaner solution is used for synchronous Ethernet, optical networking, or to clean Jetta from a spread spectrum clock replacing a clock chip that cost four to twenty five dollars. The measurement on the right shows a spread spectrum clock with effectively 2000 picoseconds of jitter being cleaned to an output clock with less than a picosecond of jitter with 80 dBs of jitter cleaning. We can also change the target frequency of the PLL by a very small amount and then change it back to the original frequency. If we do that, the output phase of the fractional PLL will have shifted by a small amount that is programmable. In 2012, one of our staff members, Blake Gray, did some research on this and compared the measurements with a noise floor of, of one hundredth of one degree to the predicted phase shift and found that the, the predicted and measured phase shift matched all the way down to his noise floor. We've used this property in three different interesting ways. The first way is that we can use a digital circuit to compare the phase of two clocks anywhere on, the, on a large SOC. The resulting comparison results in a command to either step earlier or later, and the phase step circuit is used to shift the phase of an output of a fractional PLL. This is continuously changed until the two clocks are aligned within the ability of a digital circuit to measure their alignment. As you can imagine, that's quite precise. Another application is to use multiple phase stepped fractional PLLs and some logic circuits to set and reset the output of a, of a latch and use that output to generate programmable uh, pulses. In this example, we've created a pulse generator that is able to generate two or more pulses with spacing between repeating pulses, the width of the pulses, and the alignment from the multiple pulses accurate to much, much less than one picosecond. A circuit that we are developing and plan to offer to the market very soon is a phase stepping fractional PLL together with a controller that can be used to measure the jitter of a PLL on chip. Here we have the input to the PLL, the reference clock, being sampled by the output of the PLL, which has jitter relative to the input. The output of this sampled clock would look something like this, a series of zeros followed by an early rising edge with successive low, early and late rising edges until we reach the last rising edge. The number of phase steps between the earliest and the latest rising edge is the peak to peak jitter of the PLL or the peak to peak period, period jitter, something that is extremely difficult to measure off chip. We're expecting this jitter self test circuit to be used in characterization and production testing of PLLs, but also for safety critical applications where it's important in the in the field to know the jitter of a PLL. So as I mentioned, 
we, we can't use our fractional PLL diverse as it is for every PLL application or every clocking application. And I want to introduce a few of the specialized PLLs that we've created. The first is an extremely small PLL, which is optimized for clocking digital circuits. In this PLL, we've optimized the circuits to run from core voltage only and made the loop filter much smaller. The result is a PLL able to clock relatively small, uh, low frequency digital circuits up to several hundred megahertz. And the PLL size and power are so small that, that the logic in most circuits is much larger. Another optimization is to reduce the power and area of the VCO to use extremely small power while increasing the size of the loop filter. The resulting Internet of Things PLL is able to use a real time clock 32 kilohertz clock as a reference clock and multiply that up to a useful system clock. Because the reference clock is so small, we added a startup calibration circuit that enables the clock to the PLL to generate a useful clock in only 40 cycles. When restarting or warm starting, it starts in only three cycles, which is truly fast. Despite all of this functionality, this PLL is less than 0.12 square millimeters and has no external components. Another optimization of the circuit of the fractional PLL circuit is to increase the VCO power so that the thermal noise of the VCO is low enough that the PLL can meet the demanding PCI Gen 5 application requirements. And on this slide, we compare our fully embedded low jitter fractional PLL to a discrete clock chip that is designed for the same demanding application. You can see here that the fully embedded PLL is using less than one seventh of the power or 250 milliwatts less and is saving more than two dollars not only in the direct bomb cost but also fewer pins and smaller PCB area. If the clock requirements are truly demanding. We've also created LC PLLs, and although it's unlikely that your application will need a PLL with a quarter of a picosecond of long-term jitter, it is possible, and it's reassuring to know that your PLL provider can predictably make circuits that perform this well and measure them this, that this can measure this performance. There are also cases where even a PL, any PLL is better than you need. And for those applications, we produce three free running oscillators. These RC oscillators or relaxation oscillators are used for watchdog timers to generate independent clocks for say automotive safety monitors and for IoT chips without any external components. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. Today, I've introduced you to our product range and introduced some of the flexible solutions that we've provided to customers that are in production from five nanometers to 180. And I've introduced you to some of our specialized PLLs.